uh, yesterday we I just talked about the cell shape and how the actin cytoskeleton maintains cell shape in bacteria. And today what I'm going to talk about is this uh, cytokinesis where the cytoplasm is partitioned into two and the mother cell gives rise to two daughter cells. So this is an let's get back to the beginning. So this was the first ever cell division mutants isolated by Jacob and Hirota in 1966. I just show you this again to you. Yesterday I showed you this. This is the filamentous temperature sensitive mutants, and a numerous number of them were isolated. And one of the ones that became most famous for the reason that it's like tubulin, or it is the first one to be localized to the dividing cell here. It localizes to the leading edge of the septum and it remains there. And later it was shown that it is a GTP binding protein, polymerases like that of a tubulin. And it was proposed at that time that it forms some kind of polymeric structure here and remains there and as the cell is invaginating it also constricts utilizing its GTP hydrolysis activity and that is how the cell would divide. But of course since then we have come very far now and there is indeed a lot of the rings and it was from this simple proposal you can see this E. coli cells growing in these micro channels and literally they are immortal. You will see one here that was that didn't divide and that was that died and the filamentous cell just flew away but otherwise the cell that is here is the oldest cell. It keeps constantly dividing and essentially E. coli, as long as there is a nutrient supply that is flowing here, these cells can continue to divide and they are essentially immortal cells. They can keep dividing for an enormous number of divisions. And there's the mother cell keeps giving rise to a daughter cell here. And this happens through this process of continuous formation of this FDSZ ring and cells divides into two. As I told you yesterday, bacteria did branch off before the eukaryote archa archaea lineage and this is what organisms prevalent today on this earth use uh, molecules for uh, dividing themselves. So one is FTSZ tubulin, this is a very ancient clade. Enormous number of bacteria including archaea have this uh, FTSZ. And there are few here which do not have any FTSZ or tubulin like genes and we do not know how they actually undergo the division process or what are the molecules that are involved here. And eukarya of course have this actin and a small archaea, group of archaea also have actin like proteins that utilize uh, actin for cell division. There is a group of archaea that kind of do not have any of these actins or FTSE and they use an escort 3 like complex which again in human cells is involved in the last step of cytokinesis. So without the escort the two human cells are still stuck together. And some of these also have FTSZ, but what they use for division is not very clear. Indeed, FTSZ is then a very ancient protein, and this is one of an arguments made by Davis in his uh, paper in 2002, that along the stage of codon evolution, if you look at the amino acids present in FTSZ and look at, at what amino acid peaks, FTSZ sequence probably peaks around the 7 to 8 or a stage of evolution. So this is the stage when there were only 10 amino acids are, and so FTSE evolved even prior to all the 20 amino acids actually evolved. One of the first proteins you have probably evolved is this paradox in this what is argued in this paper. And indeed the fold is very ancient and it is from where the tubulin has eventually evolved. This again I showed you yesterday that it has the same kind of structure, the GTP binding pocket and the GTP hydrolysis loop. So in summary what is FTSZ? It is all this. This is the Rosman fold with the nucleotide binding pocket where it has the T7 hydrolysis, the hydrolysis loop here and it polymerizes using GTP binding and GTP hydrolysis and in cells it forms the cytokinetic ring at the mid cell site or wherever the cell has to divide. So in eukarya the same division is brought about by actin and myosin. In bacteria it is this FTSZ or tubulin like protein and in chloroplast it is FTSZ. And chloroplast yes because they did evolve from bacteria. So cyanobacteria was the lineage to develop into chloroplast and in fact one of the chloroplasts in these uh, glucophytes still has peptidoglycan cell, cell wall. So it is a chloroplast with a peptidoglycan. And indeed it has become very clear now that if all chloroplasts utilize FTSZ to form this inner ring. 
but there is another important protein here which Abdur talked about, dynamin. So that has somehow also taken over, involved in function in these organelle divisions. So in chloroplast, FTLZ ring forms, then there is also dynamin here, of course not here, but in these chloroplasts when uh, further diversions happened. But in mitochondria, there are very few mitochondria that still have FTLZ. FTLZ seems to have been lost from mitochondria and dynamins have completely taken over division of mitochondria. And when secondary symbiosis happened, some of the chloroplasts have completely lost the FTSE ring and then they have nothing left there, nothing to do cytokinesis there. So what about organisms without FTSE? So this is a very elegant work, a series of work from Errington's lab, where they actually took existent rod-shaped bacteria which I showed you yesterday, with all the MREB and the actin-like organization and spiral organization organizing the cell wall synthesis. From there, what they did is to evolve or just grow them on antibiotic containing plates or inhibit complete cell wall synthesis. And they got colonies without on those antibiotic plates, cell wall synthesis completely inhibited and there was something like this. They are not making any cell wall, they are spherical, so they lost all the cell wall and then they went on to even put it under a controllable, genetically controllable system where the cell wall synthesis is now reduced. There is no cell wall synthetic genes in whatsoever in this system. And then they looked at how are these protoplasts dividing. FTSE is there in these. How are these protoplasts dividing? What they found surprisingly is that these protoplasts did not need FTSE. They could delete FTSZ in these. So if I just run this movie, so they can, you can see all kinds of division. There is no organized division but you can see some spring, uh, strings of vesicles coming out and they are just dividing and some, uh, some cells divide here and eventually it's just dividing like a lump of vesicles there. And they do not need any cytoskeleton, they don't need the MREB, they don't need the FTSA. But what they need is the fatty acids or the membrane rigidity itself. And if you treat with serolinin, which blocks the fatty acid synthesis, one of the fatty acid synthesis and incorporation here. They don't divide but they just grow into large spheroid like cells. So here is a case where they had evolved an existing rod shaped bacteria to divide without any cytoskeletal proteins and probably this is how the ancient cells before the evolution of FTSE or any cytoskeletal proteins must have divided which is which then invented the cytoskeleton, you got FTSZ and that was the most ancient bacteria. From that line, lineage onwards, bacteria got established and FTSZ is prevalent in all of the life forms that you see today for cytokinesis, almost all. And then the eukaryotic lineage of course came about, from the archaeal actins and this. So what do you need to pinch these membranes? In the current scenario, we have a cytoskeletal protein like FTSZ, of course, and you need to somehow couple it to the membrane. Ancient FTSE might have directly been coupled to the membrane. We do not know about any such scenario. But what happens in bacteria is that at least in E. coli there are two such proteins which are membrane anchored and the FTSZ itself assembles into a ring utilizing these two membrane anchors. And here the contractile system or the cytoskeletal system gets coupled to the membrane to pull the membrane to do the cytokinesis. The same is true in case of an eukaryotic system where the actin and the myosin ring itself is coupled to the membrane by anilin-like and F-bar-like proteins. Without these proteins, the actin is, is not coupled to the membrane and the membrane imagination does not happen. But how do you get to the site of division? So this is something where yesterday it was asked. So here are the cues. So one way to get to the middle is to actually know this is the middle. Somebody tells you this is the middle and you can go to the middle. So this is what happens in this particular fission yeast which I was talking about yesterday in Pombe. The nucleus itself plays a cue to tell this is the middle. And how does the nucleus know it is in the middle? Extremely simple as I was showing you a movie yesterday that the microtubules emanating from these nuclei are hitting the cell poles, dynamic instability, polymerizing and depolymerizing, same on this side. So eventually the microtubules pushing forces center the nucleus. So the nucleus ends up in the center of these fissionies and during a particular stage in cell cycle there is a particular clue that comes out of these nuclei and gets immediately localized to the region over the nuclei. That forms the nucleation center for where the actomyosin ring forms. So it's a positive cue. 
which is the same in mammalian cells or the human cells where the spindle, mid spindle region itself emanates signals for the act actomyosin ring organization in the middle. And in the bacteria, the first known example of a positive Q was from streptomyces, where during sporulation, molecules get localized to certain, certain spaces and FTSA gets localized to these proteins. But what are these cues actually leading to these positive cues here still remains unknown. And a recent discovery that there are dynamins in streptomyces and interacts with FTSA seems to be that dynamins play a role in that positive cue here. The other way is to tell not to go anywhere else. And then you are left with the center. So this is the most common thing in bacteria. One is the nucleoid occlusion, that if the nucleoid is there, you don't separate over the nucleoids, you don't break the nucleoid. So that's the nucleoid occlusion principle. So proteins bound on the nucleoid inhibit the polymerization of FTSZ, and therefore the ring never forms over the nucleoid. The other way, at the poles, then you do not have nucleoid, these are the free regions, FTSZ could form here. To inhibit that, there is a system in E. coli called the MIN-CDE system, which I'll talk about later. But there are other equivalents in other bacteria. It's not the same in all the bacteria. So in bacillus, it's a D4A, which is kind of equivalent to the min CD system. And even in this fission is where there are positive cues in the, coming from the nucleus, there are negative systems formed by a kinase called a POM1 kinase that forms a gradient from here to the end of the cell. In principle, this kinase gradient operates very similar to the min CD system. And even in mammalian cells and the human cells, the cortical microtubules exert a negative uh, influence on the cytokinetic ring here. So there are both positive and negative cues to form, to tell the cell where do you form the cytokinetic ring. So here is the nucleoid occlusion. So you don't have, as the nucleoid separates and segregates, you have a free region. And the polar inhibition of the min CD, make sure that no ring is formed in the poles. And as the nucleoid segregates, there is a free region in the middle of the nucleoid, and you are left with no other place in the cell, but to form a cytokinetic ring here, just at the middle of the cell. And in Colobacter crescentus, there is no nucleoid occlusion system, but there is this, again, a gradient kind of system that, lead, that is coupled to the origin of the nucleus that is moving away from this point. So as they are moving away, they create a gradient, and FTSZ ring assembly is inhibited over this nucleoid by this gradient, and the only place left is the mid cell. So how does this min CD system work? It's a very simple three-component system, three parts to it. Min C, a protein called as Min C, which is the actual inhibitor of polymerization of FTSZ. Then there is a protein called as Min D, which is in two forms. It's an ATP binding protein, and when bound to ATP, it has an affinity to the membrane. So it binds to the membrane with ATP, interacts with Min C, brings Min C to the membrane, and therefore effectively allowing Min C to block FTSZ polymerization in the membrane. And then the master is here, the mini, which constantly chases min D ATP, stimulates ATP hydrolysis in min D, and min D bound to ADP falls off the membrane. So what min E does is to form a, a ring-like structure here, over the, near the membrane, it also has a membrane binding motif, it binds to the membrane and hydrolyzes the ATP in min D and drives min D out of the membrane and therefore min Z as well falls. And as this pushes towards this end, all of this polymer depolymerizes or the min C D concentration is low here, it starts to assemble at the other end. So this gives rise to a nice oscillatory movement in a bacillus like E. coli that min C is effectively in this region over a period of 30 seconds it goes back to the other pole and then at the next 30 seconds it's at this pole. So in a time average manner what you essentially have is a very high concentration of min CD at the cell poles. TSZ would not assemble wherever min CD is. And some wonderful work from uh, Petra Schwill's lab has reconstituted this in vitro, the min CD system and you could see similarities to like how uh, gradients are formed and how you can get spatial organization and patterns just with these proteins. So these are standing waves. This is min CDE, min CD system here on the membrane, min, not min C, just min D and min E, two proteins and you can get these waves generated because min E is constantly chasing the min D. And 
there's another spiral waves that is generated by this. So changing these concentrations can give rise to these things. But of course, these are planar membranes, nowhere to do with the cylindrical geometry of the E. coli cells. What the lab next did is something like this. So what they created is, these are not cells. These are simply microfabricated wells of different sizes, of different lengths and geometries, where they could reconstitute the entire, with lipid coats, where they could reconstitute the min E, min D in these holes there. And then you could observe under a microscope. And in fact, they have, what I'm not showing you is the FTLC here. This, this is the min C or one of the proteins here that is that will oscillate now. But you could also put FTLC along with it and show that FTLC would self-organize into a ring-like structure wherever the min CD concentration is low. So you can watch this, all these oscillations in different geometries and different shapes. So what about chloroplast? I said it has FTLC. Are the other proteins like min C and everything identical to that because it's coming from the bacterial lineage? Indeed, if chloroplasts do have the min C homologs like the arc C, it is not related to the FTSA or anything, but it allows it to membrane anchor. Chloroplast has two FTSZ. FTSZ has duplicated and diversified there with two kinds of polymerization pro properties and dynamics here. And subsequently, there are other proteins that have been added to the chloroplast that has to link the inner membrane to the outer membrane now and allows dynamin to be forming a ring-like architecture on the external side. So without FTSE, the chloroplast would not divide. So it is FTSE that decides where the chloroplast is going to divide. FTSE dynamics do play a role in chloroplast division, but dynamin also plays an equally important role. So if you had to tear apart this entire thing and just consider it as ring-like structures, these are different proteins and different layers in the chloroplast. So chloroplast uses a very similar mechanism for division. And so is true with mitochondria, at least in the two ancient uh, red algae. So that was about the uh, localization and where it positions in the mid cell site or where the positioning of the ring is. So I'm just jumping a little bit here. I'll come back to the assembly later. But what I will do is talk about constriction before I talk about assembly. So once you have assembled a ring-like structure here, what you need to do is to form the septa there basically construct the or imaginate the membrane. How does this process happen? So of course, this is the most famous actomyosin ring that we all know that it's a purse string model and the myosin is there and it pulls the actin anti-parallel filaments here. So that is depicted in this cartoon here. The actin is in anti-parallel fashion. The myosin two motor bundles these actin and as they are walking towards the myosin, they are just, as the plus end, they are just pulling the actin uh, anti-parallel actin towards each other. And in fact, actin depolymerization and other factors like cofilin also play an important role there. So this is an example where actomyosin is completely now out of the cell. The cells have been protoplasted and the membrane has been dissolved using tritonics, uh, using a detergent. So the ring is remaining here with some amount of membrane bound to it. It's not a complete sphere as well. So it is complete, it's like a ghost. So you don't have any cellular components left there except for the ring components that was already present in the cell. So this actin and myosin and other ring components like formins which were needed for actin polymerization that are still holding on to that place. So you see this, this, as soon as you add ATP, ATP it just goes to construct. So this is another movie again showing. So that flash was because when we are adding ATP it just goes out of focus. So actin, myosin, and few other crosslinkers that are present here are sufficient for actomyosin ring con uh, constriction. And if you block the myosin activity, this would not go on to constrict. So coming back to the prokaryotes, FTSZ. So there are many theories about FTSZ, not many theories, but many views about how FTSZ can constrict the membranes. One primarily is the FTSZ centric view that FTSZ is the all-in-all -all powerful motor, the cytoskeleton, the force generator, and the motor and everything. So this idea is pro uh, proposed by Erickson where he did some experiments with liposomes, reconstituted FTSZ along with the membrane anchor FTSA here, reconstituted into these liposomes, it assembles into the ring-like structures and over time you can see the ring constricting. And you can see this gap being closed here and finally these two vesicles would completely close in the gap there. So it seems like FTSZ, FTSZ 
and FTSA are sufficient to pull or invaginate these membranes and contribute to division. <laughs> How do I do that? So it's not a complete circle in this case. Electron chromographs from Grant Jensen's lab in variety of bacterial species has shown some kind of asymmetrical division. So the invaginating septa is not coming symmetrically from the both ends, but it is just coming from one end. And it seems like FTSZ is localized to the invaginating places. So wherever there is invagination, you see FTSC protofilaments in the cryoelectron microscope. So these are FTSC algs that is depicted in these cartoons. And what they propose is that the membrane bending, FTSC tether to the membrane and FTSC bending upon GTP hydrolysis can generate the force to pull the membrane and that is sufficient to cause the membrane invagination. And in fact, the back of the envelope calculation made by Erickson shows that this kind of in vitro studies have shown that FTSZ is of 130 nanometers here. And if you take a cantilever model and take 65 nanometers from here, and if you had to bend this, and FTSZ is by EM, they can know that they have an arch of this kind of a structure. And this is about a deflection of 20 nanometers. Using such a calculation, you can get to a force of nearly 2.6 piconewtons, which seemingly is sufficient to pull membranes and invaginate membranes. And a more detailed quantification of, or a uh, model of this is uh, uh, published by Allard and uh, Cetribum here. So here it seems like FTSZ, just by its GTP hydrolysis and bending caused by the GTP hydrolysis is sufficient to pull the membranes. However, other experiments by Ian Loeb's group using the same cryo-electron tomography method, reconstitution in vesicles and observation in E. coli, seem to suggest some other model. What they can observe is complete ring-like structures. So this ring is around three to four filaments in diameter here, and the diameter is almost 90 nanometers, very highly constricted ring, of course, not like the one micron in the E. coli that I talked about, around 60 nanometers in width. And the FTSA itself tethered to the FTSA is around 12 nanometers away from the membrane. And they observe that vesicles, wherever FTSA rings are assembled, vesicles are constricting. And they go on to suggest a sliding filament model, just like the actomyosin ring. So you have the actin antiparallel filaments, and they are pulled by myosin, and you have the sliding filament model for constriction. So what Ian Lowe's group has recently suggested is that FTSG can undergo the sliding mechanism. But what drives the sliding mechanism is somewhat unclear. Are these filaments really antiparallel? How does FTSG reorient itself among these uh, filaments? Is it treadmilling? Is it the GTP hydrolysis uh, contributing to this kind of filament sliding? Uh, those questions are unclear as. Other way, of course, all these bacteria have a cell wall. So you need a combination of both the cell wall and FTS. So this has been recently published by two groups, one from Ethan Garner's group and another uh, Zia's uh, group and Casey Huang's group here. So what they suggest is that cell wall synthesis is an important component, but the cell wall synthesis itself is driven by the treadmilling property of FTSE. So you have the FTSE polymer, FTSZ is polymerizing here and hydrolysis of GTP causes depolymerization at the other end. Coupled to the cell wall synthesis assembly machinery here, just like what you saw for the MREB, the actin cytoskeleton making the cell wall hoops. Here it is, the difference is that it's not on the long, uh, cylindrical axis, but it is around the septa. So the MREB was here. In this case, it's the dividing septa here. It is in this, so if I just turn around this, it's a circle. So they are just going on the septal region. So that is where the FTS is. This is the actin, this is the FTSA. So indeed what Ethan Garner's group can nicely show is by labeling with the uh, fluorescent DMN acids, because DMN acids get into the cell wall. If you initially add a pulse of red here, and then a pulse of green, and then a blue, what you are added first ends up being in the center saying that initially the cell wall was being made. So this was the first labeled DMN acids. It labels the cell wall. And as the cell wall progression happens, the cell wall has ended up in the center. The next one is outside, so outside in. So the cell wall is being made or constructed. Initially, FTLZ forms this cell wall, and then the next layer, and then the next layer. So this ends up being in the center, then the next layer, so they could do a pulse like this. And if they did a very short duration of pulse, you end up with these patches. So what it shows is, again, this is not 
circumferentially going on in one complete rounds. In a very short pulse, FTSZ is making a cell wall here. And when you add the next amino acid, there is another FTSZ molecule here, and then you have another cell wall assembly here, one here, and again here, and the next one here. So there is some, just like I talked about the actin going on circumferentially, the treadmilling motion of FTSZ is circumferentially going around and organizing the cell wall synthesis. So this is depicted in this cartoon here. So the FTSZ is polymerizing. And you have the cell wall synthesis machinery coupled to it and making these hoops of cell wall here, the new peptoglycan. So the cell wall definitely contributes the invagination. So this is a combination of FTSE treadmilling and the cell wall contributing. But another view is that FTSE does nothing but to just come there and form the scaffold for organizing the cell wall synthesis. And it's the cell wall synthesis that primarily drives the entire cytokinesic process. And this turns out to be probably true in, at least in case of the Staphylococcus aureus, the bacterium here. So what you see here is a very recent paper here. The, when you have FTSZ rings of one micron in size, they go on to construct. And when they take this point, when after they have reached the size of around 0.7, again they, they construct much faster. There is a time, there is a time aspect here. This go on to construct and after it has reached this size, the rate seems to be much faster. But what they did is they added a drug here which blocks the treadmilling of FTSZ. It's known to lock FTSZ in its filament. It's just known, uh, locks the FTSZ filaments. When they treat with such a drug here, the cells that have a one micron ring, they do not go on to constrict. So this is a chymograph here. They don't constrict. However, when you add them to cells that have undergone some kind of constriction to 0.7 microns, the drug does nothing to them. And the reason being that in this, during this constriction, the cell wall synthesis has happened, and now the cell wall synthesis is completely driving the invagination of the cell. FTSC has nothing to do there. So this is depicted in the chymograph here. So you have this larger rings, it doesn't constrict. But when you have the small rings, they go on to constrict even in the presence of the drug. And this is for the eukaryote, but a few years earlier, it was also shown to be true for this eukaryote combi. So the actomyosin ring assembles, and then after a while, the cell wall synthesis can completely take over that. What they did is to treat with this actin depolymerizing drug latte, after the actomyosin ring has assembled and the construction has begun. And you can see that the entire septa is still going to closure. Septum formation goes to complete. So what you need actomyosin ring or whatever imagination is needed probably is the initial stage, but then if you have the cell wall machinery going on, that can give a much stronger force to constrict or separate the cells. So this was the reason I skipped assembly because we know a lot about where it is positioned, how the ring is probably constricting, but we, what we do not know in case of FTSZ is how the cell goes or how FTSZ goes from this monomeric structure. So this filament is known because GTP binding, but how does it go to this ring-like structure from there? How is the ring assembled? This is something which is not very well understood in uh, prokaryotic systems yet. In eukaryotes, of course, we know all about the nucleators, the actin nucleators, formins, and these formins are localized at the mid-cell site from cues from the nucleus after this protein comes over here. The nucleators also come here, and the actin starts to polymerize from these nucleators here, and these, these movies will show you that as the actin is polymerizing, here they are pulling these actin polymerases and cables are there and those are then dragged towards these rings. This kind of moves in here and the ring assembles completely here. These are, these are just mutants of yeast that are much longer to just show the visual effect of how, I think that one is not, I think, ah, there it is. This is the wild type where the actin cables are being formed and the actin ring forms here. And then these are other mutants where it can be, the effect is more exaggerated here to show the effect of the actin nucleation and the filaments here. And in bacteria, there are no such nucleators for FTSZ. So how does FTSZ assemble? FTSZ ought to be somewhat self-assembly. And this was indeed showed very elegantly from Erickson's group. What they did is I told you that FTSZ needs this protein to anchor to the membrane. And this protein is anchored to the membrane with a small 13 amino acid uh, residue here. What they simply did is to take off this interacting part here, took FTSZ, took off this interacting part of this one, took this protein from here and fused it to FTSZ with a fluorescent tag here. 
And now what you need, FTA, the FTSZ would simply go to the membrane. You don't need any of the other proteins here. And when they could, re they reconstituted these in lipid bilayers. This is not really bilayer, but this multilayered. And somehow FTSZ, they could get FTSZ inside these lipid tubes, and FTSZ would self-organize into ring-like structures inside these membranes. And at the same time, what we could, what we did is going using our yeast system, express the yeast protein with a fusion in uh, the E. coli FTSZ in yeast here, and they form the cytoplasmic rings here. We didn't have any mem membrane anchors, they still form ring-like structures. So probably ring assembly does not require membrane anchoring. What we could further show is that even in the cytoplasm of the yeast, this entire assembly disassembly process or turnover of FTSZ was similar to that of a bacterial cell. So here is the FTSZ ring. If you bleach the T half measured in bacterial cells at about 10, 10 seconds, we could show in the yeast system as well this entire ring structure is turning over with the similar half-life period. So the polymers here are constantly depolymerizing and polymerizing back. Further, we wanted to see how are these rings actually assembled. We took this FTSZ wild type expressing in yeast. We found some cells which are having these filament-like structures. And somehow we could see all of them being at some kind of rate converted into ring-like structures or spot-like structures. Of course, it, from this image, I cannot make out what is exactly happening here. It's too much. So what we did is to make a bunch of mutants of FTSZ which were already known. So here is a GTP hydro binding mutant. If you don't bind GTP, it will not polymerize, so it doesn't polymerize. Here is a mutant that doesn't bind GTP so well. There is a tenfold reduction in the GTP binding, known biochemically. It doesn't form rings. It forms only this filament-like structures. But the most interesting mutant was this particular mutant, where the GTP binding is as normal as the wild type, but GTP hydrolysis is almost 30-fold lower. So here we found three kinds of cells, one that have the single rings, another that have just the linear polymers, and some of the cells which seem to have this ring and this filaments connected. And what was more surprising is this diameter of these rings, be it the wild type or this mutant, was pretty much the constant as measured by fluorescent circles, around 500, 600 nanometers. And this brings back to the size limits that I talked, uh, talked about yesterday. So this is the same bacterium that I showed you yesterday, which is like 600 microns lapsed. How does it divide? It doesn't divide at the middle or anything. It, has, it forms a tiny daughter cell at the end of this cell, mother cell, uh, one at this end and the other at this end. And the diameter of this FTSZ ring, when it begins to assemble, is around 3 microns. But a fully assembled FTSZ ring is just over 1.5 microns or close to 2 microns. So it seems like FTSZ has an intrinsic curvature which has been fixed much earlier in course of evolution. And that probably decides the size of a bacterium, or decided the size of a bacterium. The bacteria could never be larger than that size. So a division limit, a division size limit has already been established because FTSE evolved much, much earlier. So this is just a kind of an hypothetical idea. We have no way to, again, test this, or how do we, how do we test this is not very clear at, right now. So it's not very scientific then. So here is the DNA staining of that. What you see is the two DNA here. And the entire mother cell DNA completely degrades. And that serves as the nutrients for this daughter cell. So going back to our mutants, we took this mutant and cells that were having these linear filaments. When we looked at these linear filaments under a microscope, this is what is. The entire linear filament at some point forms a lariat-like structure. The entire filament is being drawn into this ring-like structure. So what this shows is linear filaments could somehow be reorganized into ring-like structures. And this, in fact, corroborated well with some of the earlier studies that were there during sporulation and uh, bacillus subtilis. So during sporulation and bacillus subtilis, what happens is initially, as the cell is vegetatively dividing, you have the septa or the FTSZ ring being formed right at the middle of the cell. But in a sporulating cell, that fate is changed, and the cell now decides to form an asymmetric septa. And the FTSZ reorganizes or disappears from here and forms the ring at one side. And how does this happen? This has been seen. We formed 
as helice like structure slowly condense or com compress into a ring like structure in this part during sporulation and bustles. So some of this kind of linear structure can be compressed into a ring, uh, ring like structure is what it seemed like. So in fact we could show again here this ring is actually turning around here you can see the bleach mark and it just keeps going around and you can indeed show this these filaments are actually moving into the ring like structure making a bleach mark here the bleach mark keeps going towards the ring like structure. So the filament is actually being dragged into the ring like structure. Further, what are the determinants of ring assembly? So this was the mutant I showed you that forms this ring like structures. What we further did is if this was the protofilament axis of FTSD, we made a bunch of mutants on this side and this side of FTSD and looked at some mutants. One of the mutants turned out to be very interesting, this one. It forms these linear filaments just like the mutants initially that would have, but it never forms the lariat like structure, it never gets, gets that curvature to form the ring like structures. So what it seemed from all these observations that FTS said, the monomeric form binds GTP, polymerizes into a linear polymer like that and taking cues from tubulin where the hydrolysis actually gives rise to a curvature. Even in FTSE we thought that a curvature is generated and that being, that curvature is then stabilized by lateral contacts like some of these mutations. So as GTP hydrolysis when the GDP is lost or in case of tubulin the GDP remains then the tubulin, the two subunits of tubulin have a different curvature. So you are stacked top of each other, they now bend. But of course that is just taking a cue from the tubulin, but today we know that GTP bound FTSZ also has an intrinsic curvature. So we really do not know what is driving this ring assembly, what process is driving. At least we know some determinants like lateral interactions and some curvature is needed, but what exactly drives this ring assembly is something which is not clear. What it shows that FTSC self assembles from these linear like structures and its ring assembly itself is a self assembly process. So this is a filament that is FTSC with a GTP bound filament seems to have a slight curvature with a 2.5 degree angle between each of those subunits. And which again perfectly matches with this just over 1.2 micron size of FTSC ring. So this GTP bound FTSZ ring would not be more than 1.2 microns. And then Chimoto Michison and uh, Luz who had actually done the work with Petra Shvel on my, the min CD waves that I showed you, went on to go to do a postdoc with uh, Tim Michison and they reconstituted the FTSA and FTSZ on a lipid membrane and what you see is this. So you can see this all these polymers, FTSA is bound on the lipid and FTSZ is added. They form all this like nice polymers and you start to emerge like vortexes or circle, circle like uh, or ring like structures that are constantly in motion. And this is just a zoom up of that, you can see more clearly here I suppose. Yeah, you can see, start seeing all these vortices. So FTSZ is constantly polymerizing and depolymerizing there and FTSA is there. You spontaneously organize into ring like structures which are in constant motion and they could show that FTSZ actually treadmills. So there is polymerization as one end and depolymerization as the other. But still there are certain outstanding questions on how these rings are exactly assembled, what are the nature of these filaments and how the force is generated. So is FTSZ seems to still generate some force, maybe cell wall is important, cell wall is definitely important, but FTSZ still seems to generate some force. This is the sliding mechanism, is the bending of the membrane sufficient? And what is finally the universal nature of cytokinetic, uh, are there any universal mechanisms that can guide cytokinetic principles or cytokinesis? It's something that remains to be answered. So how do FTSZ assembles in, assemble in vivo? So to do this, what we did is to use our yeast system where we got this nice FTSZ rings, randomly mutagenized FTSZ, put back into the yeast cells and look for FTSZ that would not form ring like structures. So now this could be done in yeast more easily than bacteria because in bacteria any of these mutants that would not assemble rings would be lethal, you would not get them back. So that is why we use this yeast system and here we have a bunch of mutants that do not assemble into rings and interestingly two of them are trapped in this kind of helix structure. If you can see this here it seems to be like a helical, it is not very clear but still you can probably see some helix like structures in two of these mutants. This is worse, this is still somewhat better. So what are these uh, 
helix like structures. So, during the course of study with this FTSZ expression in ease, what we also did is to understand the FTSZ structure in these rings. We did an electron microscopy study. So, this is electron tomography where you do electron, same like electron microscopy, but you collect images at multiple angles from the same sample. So, if I have a three dimensional image, I am just seeing the projection, but when you get the projection, you can take multiple projection at different angles. So, it is like I have a three dimensional cube, you take a projection when light is at this angle, you have a shadow here, then you have a shadow, then you have a perfect square shadow and the light is perfect, then you have other, other kind of shadows here. So, then you can put all these images back computationally to reconstruct the entire three dimensional image. So, that is the tomography here. So, this is a FTS the ring of the mutant in the E cell. So, what you are seeing is through the E cell, each of these black lines is a single 4 nanometer filament of FTSE. It's somewhat in it's not in concentric circles because you can see that in the next plane one of these is actually getting connected. So it's not simply concentric circles there, but it is a rope. If I have to just drop a uh, tight rope like that with a, like the I don't know if you have, all of you have heard about the rope uh, the Indian rope trick. So you have a huge snake like rope there and you can pull that rope and uh, and if you drop that rope it will again form back into the spiral. So it is something like that kind of a structure here. There is a filament of FTSE that you can see the tail coming out and the entire filament is organized into this ring like structure. The cartoon might be better. There is a single section and this is a simple cartoon where I have just drawn green lines over each of these black lines. So this inner diameter is around 200, 250 nanometers. The outer diameter is around 450 nanometers and the entire height of this barrel is around 600 nanometers. So here you have a huge amount of FTSC because of the GTP hydrolysis mutant. But the what we imagine is that the wild type to be is just two or three filaments thick as I showed you from the cryo electron microscopy of what Yellow had done and bacterial cells. So now what are those mutants that I showed you in helical trap? So what we imagine is that so this, is, so, this is the mutant and if you just take two or three slices of it, this will be these rings that Ian Lowe had solved uh, using the cryon electron microscope. So, what are these mutants? So, if I take these barrel like structures and if I have to just hold the two ends and pull it apart, what we imagine is this is what is happening in these mutants. That these mutants are unable to compress themselves or organize themselves into a ring like structure, but they are still having this curvature and the helix is formed. So, in a way FTSC is like a compressible spring. So, you have this self driven interactions between these filaments here that it can compress itself into a ring like structure and there might be positive and negative factors in bacterial cells that are modulating this spring structures by not allowing these interactions or by forcing these interactions. So, this is back to our question that in bacteria, a lot of bacteria do have FTSA, they divide using FTSA and how FTSA assembles in these bacteria is something that we are interested in. So, okay. so that brings to the end of the cytokinesis part of FTSA, but what we are interested further is since there are a diverse set of molecules that are able to do this membrane fission and constrict membranes and there are some bacteria which we don't know how they are happening. What we are also interested in asking a question that can we get alternative forms of cytokine, can we get take something else, some kind of polymer, remodel it into by anchoring into the membrane, can we drive it to divide the membranes. So that is something which we would like to do at some point of time. So the ideas there are like you take all these set of cytoskeletal proteins that are available like 40, 50 families of actins and different proteins that I showed you yesterday, take them, put them to random mutagenesis with a membrane anchor here and reconstitute in the membrane vesicle. And the ideal system would be not the protoplast that I just showed you, could be one possibility, but the ideal system would be the in vitro vesicles where you can reconstitute here in a cell free system. So that's an example that is already done with FTSZ and FTSA and ZIPA here. So what you are seeing, seeing here is FTSZ filaments, probably it's not of the right concentration to actually form a ring like structure here. So what they simply did is to take a liposome a cell free uh, protein synthesis extract from E. coli, packed it into these liposomes with plasmids carrying this FTSE with 
FTSE, FTSA, and these three genes, and packed it into this. And now this cell-free system is able to make the protein that you want to make. There is no complexity of your genomic DNA and other gene expression patterns feedback into how much threshold they have, how much protein they can make. So just two, three plasmids here, and you can make whatever protein you want to make here by putting into these plasmids. So we'd like to take such an approach to study these FTSE mutants to see if they actually have any constriction defects or assembly defects. That brings me to the end of this talk. So I'd really like to thank all my lab members and Mohan's lab where a lot of this work was done earlier as opposed to others. Any questions? Today I should leave you with this. Uh, hope I can see all of you at least next time at NICE. Welcome to NICE. Any questions? If, uh, FTSC is forming a long filament and then there is a snap cytokinesis. Mm, okay, so that, that I, I should just clarify that movie that that was the best of the videos that we had, so I still keep showing that. But the yeast happens to divide there. It snaps, so the FTSC uh, breaks, the filament breaks there because the yeast is dividing. But the yeast cell cycle is completely de decoupled to FTSC rings here. So it has nothing to do with the snapping of the FTSC filament or these, there are other yeast where we can see the ring assembly even without the ring being, even without the filament being snapped. So there is no correlation between the filament being snapped and assembly of the ring like structure, FTSE ring like structure in the yeast cells. But I will talk with, with the context of this video, like uh, it's snapped and they just spiral around each other. Is there any orientation effect? Like it's being clockwise, it's being anti-clockwise. Oh yeah, it doesn't seem like we have looked at movies to see whether it is left-handed or right-handed, but it seems equal, but we have not analyzed enough, which we need to do if we have lot number of more movies and then we need to do some, in kind of, some kind of automated base segmentation. If we can do, that will be good. Too. That is something that will be done. Any questions? Yeah. In the case of bacillus, when it decides to sporulate, the septum goes to the side. So, how, what happens there? Uh, asymmetric septum formation. So, uh, asymmetric septum formation, it's not clear what exactly triggers the asymmetric septum formation, but there are upstream this, the SPO2A and the SPO1A family of proteins, or the SPO2E, there's a transcription factor, and a lot of genes are upregulated there. And that disassembles this forming ring here. So the uh, other proteins that are involved in anchoring FTSZ is also disassembled, they are all moved there. But how exactly the site is chosen, how do you choose one third of the site, right. is not very clear. That I don't think is clear in bacillus at least yet. Because there are also species of bacillus where you get the spore in the middle. In bacillus at least it's at one end, but the spore can be in a lot of places in other species of uh, bacillus. So, what decides where the spore will actually be is something that has not been studied. Uh, so uh, I have a basic question which might connect like with the previous lecture. So uh, the volume of the cell is conserved, but it divides. It means that we need to add some plasma membrane, right? On which end it occurs? Like, because when you squish, I imagine the opposite side would be like um, on, on the stress. Right. You mean in bustle in the sporulation or? No, no. no normal in, division? In, gen in general. So in general, they are of equal volumes usually. Right? Or even in case of somewhat asymmetric division, you have the same cytoplasm is there and the turgor pressure is still there. So there is no other, uh, I don't see why you need to push or you need anything else there. So the membrane is just pushed, uh, pulled against this turgor pressure. And that is where the cell wall is also important because against the turgor pressure, when you want to pull these membranes, probably FTSD is not sufficient to do that. So uh, in this process, plasma membrane is not added anywhere, right? So we just no, plasma wish... Uh, no, 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 plasma membrane synthesis has to happen. So lipids have to be added. Lipids have to be added. Hmm. So there is... Lipids have to be added, cell wall synthesis. So if this is the invaginating septa here, the lipids have to be added here. The cell wall synthesis machinery itself or the uh, precursors pass on to this membrane and the cell wall or peptidoglycan strands have to be growing here. So a lot of synthesis is happening in this place. Mm. A lot of material addition is happening in that place. You have to add material. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks.
this uh, film of FTSZ uh, assembly, self-assembly that you showed, reminded me of what Zorana showed, the Lionel Penrose film, except that that was a simulation of uh, DNA self-assembly. So my question was, seeing that film, every now and then you could see these little units swerve a little bit to the side, not go head on. So I'm wondering in this FTZ assembly, if you have a small curvature in the basic unit, would that be enough to give you a ring? Yes, so that is the idea. So GTP itself having bound, GTP bound FTZ itself has this small curvature. So that somehow, but needs to be stabilized. That curvature is generated, but once you get that full ring-like structure, how do you stabilize that ring-like structure? What is causing them to assemble and be like a ring? No, but if you close the ring, isn't that enough? So that the last element binds to the first element? No, it doesn't seem to be closed ring like that. That's the other problem here. So it is not that FTSZ completely forms a single closed ring like structure. It's not the first subunit just comes and binds back to the last subunit here. So it, it is something like a loop here. So the last subunit is still not closing in on the first subunit. It's not a ring in that sense. There is some opening there and then this goes over this or above this. If I start to draw the next layer, it goes over. Yeah, it's kind of a spring but highly compressed. So any questions? So only case where the closed ring actually comes in in the GDP bond form, it has a very high curvature. So these are just 23 nanometers. So you have these closed rings have been observed in EM, but there are just 23 nanometers in diameter. The GTP bond form itself doesn't seem to form these closed rings. Well, uh, if no question, then I thank Srinivasan for his pleasant uh, seminar. And I thank him for that. <laughs>